Anand here from Duke University. So uh, Manoj is a you know, health economist and is doing very important work uh, right now in India with the COVID situation. So, but uh, we're also fortunate that he's right now in India and uh, available to talk to us about some of his more recent work, uh, which is a little bit more complete on information and facilitation interventions for accountability in health and nutrition. Uh, so this is, um, you know, an event, uh, with, sorry, this is a paper with uh, Vikram Rajan at the World Bank, Kendall Swanson at Duke University, and Harsha Thirumurthy at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so the plan for today is that uh, Manoj will uh, speak for about 45, 50 minutes or so. If you have questions, feel free to, um, you know, put your, uh, post them in the chat box. And uh, I think we'll have a small number of people, so not uh, so perhaps when, you know at certain points I can even call on you to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question if you like. And uh, perhaps you know the total event will last about one hour. Now we are recording the event, and uh, the uh, you know recording will go on YouTube on the IMA uh, YouTube channel as well as the uh, Center for Management in Healthcare Services channel on YouTube. So uh, without much more ado, uh, Manoj, the floor is all yours. And so uh, we'll go for about 40, 45 minutes. Thank you very much, Tarun. It's wonderful to join you guys here. And um, this is, uh, it, was, it turned out to be really good timing for me because like you said, I, I was uh, unable to leave from India when the COVID epidemic struck. So um, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to make the most of it and join you at the seminar. So fantastic. Um, so this, uh, this uh, paper, describes findings from a research project that we had been doing, uh, as you know, field projects go on for a very long time, but this one had been going on for almost six, seven years. Um, we had been working with the UP government um, as part of a World Bank funded project. So Vikram was the task team leader and head of the project, and we uh, were trying to understand if we can use social accountability interventions to improve delivery of care. Um, and as I will tell you in a second, uh, the government was extremely keen to try and uh, learn from this experience, but also try to replicate and modify their state level programs uh, in response to these findings. Um, towards the end, I'll also tell you some of the more uh, sl slightly disheartening part of the news is the, the, the political realities that despite finding effects, sometimes these things do not get scaled up as we'd like. Um, and that's a very important point to keep in the back of our head as we, as we learn about these kinds of programs. Um, I know Tarun just announced that you, know, you might want to send comments and stuff. Um, if any of you are comfortable leaving your screens open and your, sorry, your video screens open, and so I'm saying this very, for very personal uh, benefit reasons that I get some feedback. Otherwise, it's almost like you're looking into a, a blank screen with the exception of Tarun then has to uh, take all that responsibility and pay attention. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so here we are. Um, first of all, this is uh, this project has benefited a lot from uh, support from a lot of people, and uh, including folks from the government of UP, the World Bank, uh, Gates Foundation, which supported some of the work, um, as well as incredible data collection that came from Sambodhi and Morsel, as well as um, the AMS, which is a group based out of uh, Lucknow and Baru as well. So motivating this, we know that there are huge problems in public service delivery globally, whether it's in health, education, or the other sectors. Uh, these problems are well known and have been well documented. We know that people do not necessarily do what they're supposed to do. They do not perform at the level that they're even capable of doing, sometimes because of lack of incentive, sometimes because of lack of motivation. Um, sometimes it's just uh, difficult to work in these circumstances. There are structural reasons why service delivery might be hard. The accountability interventions broadly in this uh, setup have aimed to try and engage the community instead to monitor the delivery of these services by increasing their participation in governance and then achieve these development goals. So in, this, in some sense, it takes some of the responsibility that we would normally leave to governments to identify the social needs that us as, as citizens would need and identify those social preferences and implement them and instead let the citizens be active participants who can make sure they get what they want. Now, broadly speaking, the literature on accountability efforts have focused on a range of different topics. So you might have seen a lot of papers by Ben Olkin and others on, on things like road construction to see if so public goods are being well delivered and well, well produced or not. 
there's literature that looks at food and, and as well as in education. Broadly, the evidence is kind of mixed, but it's still promising. There's some really good things that can come out of com in engaging the community in delivering these services. The debate, however, is not per se whether participation is good, but that what the mechanism underlying this participation could be. Um, the two things to think about here is one, is it an information constraint? And of course, a lot of economists would like to believe and see that it's the information constraint that's at work. Because if it is an information constraint, we can understand that, that sort of market failure. On the other hand, if participation because some kind of a facilitation mechanism, a coordination failure is, a, is, is, the, is the mechanism at work here, then it's a much deeper question that one needs to understand um, about how we can try and solve these problems. So in health, there is a little bit of a literature um, on the effects of community mobilization. And this comes much more sort of the, the there's also great literature coming from NGOs and, and these development organizations that have looked at community mobilization. And they found in general fairly large effects. But when it comes down to these mechanisms through which accountability works, is it the effect of information? Is it the effect of people coming together and doing something differently? That evidence has been fairly thin. So on this slide, I'd like to sort of lead you through the, uh, the state of knowledge that we are right now. Um, the biggest paper that has, and I say by biggest, I mean the most well-known paper in this literature is Martina Bjorkman and Jacob Svensson's 2010 paper, uh, The Power to the People. Uh, it's probably the most widely known for two reasons. One, it was presenting something very simple. That is, you know, they had these meetings that they organized in villages in Uganda. And a year later, they found very large reductions in under five mortality. Now, as we all know, as experimental research goes, you know, you, you can run an experiment and there is an expected value of the effect, effect but then each draw of that experimental result could be slightly different. Um, so some of my, actually my own students um, have tried to do the replication on these results on the, with the data and stuff, and they find generally the results hold. So only the one interpretation might be there might be something unique about Uganda at that time period in that setting that led to these very large effects. I should qualify what very large means. They found about 30% reductions in under five mortality by simply organizing accountability meetings, right? And the meetings also gave information to households about the state of their uh, services that are being delivered, the state of the outcomes that these services were targeted at. Um, but these are very large effects. In the follow-up research that uh, they did with, uh, in this case, they also brought Damien Devalk onto the team and they were trying to look up at the follow-up effects and they tried to see, can they tease out the mechanism? What they found is that the facilitation alone doesn't do very much, but the way they did it was that they organized a meeting where there was, the community meeting was organized, but without giving them any, any information. And then the other one was where the information and facilitation was given, just like the original project. Now, the reason why that is true, statistically, it makes perfect sense. And you can sort of, if you believe that the effects are additive and you can separate out what the effects are, it makes sense, except it's very hard to organize a community participation meeting without giving people information. That would be the equivalent of us trying to organize a seminar without saying what the topic is or the speaker is and expecting people to show up and sit there for the next hour as well. That's just, is very, it's a, it's a tall order. It's theoretically, I can see why that makes sense, but in terms of actually the policy implications of how governments might be able to run with it, it makes, a lot, it, makes it a lot more challenging. So then um, uh, the subsequent work, uh, Pia Raffler, Dan Posner, uh, and Doug Parkerson has this, have this 2018 paper where what they did essentially was they took the power to the people paper and they scaled it up. They implemented that exact same uh, Bjorkman Spencer intervention nationally using a giant funding that they got from DFID. And what they found was that uh, the, the effects on the outcomes, unlike the 30% mortality, was actually very modest. They found some modest improvements on treatment quality. Um, and then they also found a little bit of effect on patient challenges, but nothing else, right? So it points towards the challenges of scale. That is, you, could, you can run probably a very tightly run program in about 25 villages in Uganda. But then if you want to scale it up, how you introduce that kind of scaling with what partners you do. In this case, they basically got whoever was able to implement in the rural areas and you work with that. 
in a parallel study, they call this the T4D uh, study, uh, Arcades and others, what they did was they ran about 100 uh, villages in Indonesia and 100 villages in Tanzania, and they tried to do very similar efforts. Uh, the difference, however, here was they said they will not be prescriptive at all. Unlike the Uganda study where the researchers had developed a protocol where you go collect information, produce stylized information, share it with the villagers, organize these meetings. In Indonesia and Tanzania, they said, no, let people just decide and do whatever they want. And so by letting community do, the, do whatever they needed to, in some sense, gave them the flexibility, but it found no impact at all. And that plausibly points towards the inability of these types of community mobilization mechanisms to independently A, identify the problem very clearly, but also that it has to be a problem that can be solved. You can identify giant problems that have no solutions, right? So you need to find a solvable problem. And third, plan a very careful set of actions that can solve that problem, right? So making, taking an idea that communities can solve it and implementing it in a way that's scalable turns out to be really hard. Now, while these two large studies find relatively disappointing, if you will, uh, findings. Uh, Andrela Dubey and others um, have this, Johannes Haushofer and Christensen, they have this really nice paper that's forthcoming now, where they were doing very similar types of interventions, community accountability, community monitoring type of interventions. They were working in Sierra Leone just around the time when the uh, Ebola outbreak came along. And what they found was, sure, Ebola has massive amounts of mortality. So you, know, you can't really see much going on in terms of the mortality effects. But what they do find is areas where they had introduced these kinds of scorecards and community monitoring, there, they had, there were large improvements in the care-seeking behavior as well as treatment-seeking behavior. So the households uh, were receiving better treatment and were also reaching out to the healthcare clinics to get better care during the course of the uh, Ebola crisis. And that sort of is a very large effect they find and, and is, is very sort of, it's broadly consistent with what community monitoring can do. There are a few other uh, papers as well in progress. So this one with uh, Javier Gine and um, um, Khalid and Mansouri um, look at the effects of women's participation in Pakistan. And they find in general that the, the intermediate measures, if you will, ANC visits, PNC visits have gone up. Um, this is still work in progress and you'll find, we, we look forward to hearing from their results. So Manoj, can I interrupt you? I mean, you know, I don't usually interrupt so early, but I would like your little bit of perspective and uh, feel free to defer this response to the end if that is um, so I have two questions. So first is that, you know, I think you're drawing this distinction between information effects versus community facilitation and participation kind of thing. And as you rightly said, um, you know, it, it will almost make no sense for the two to be unbundled. Yeah. So apart from us as academics and people who are interested in really fine tuning mechanisms, uh, why would we want, you know, as a policy matter, want to unbundle and test the unbundled effects? I agree. So that is my first question. Okay. My second question is actually in some of these, uh, about your perspective on some of these failed replications. I think, uh, you know, one concern with these replications is that uh, the replicator faces a challenge of trying to understand whether they should stay true to the original implementation and therefore not customize according to, you know, what the community wants. So basically you get, you know, implementing something which is mismatched for the community needs simply because you were trying to stay to the original or you, you know, abandon your pure replication of effort and therefore you're not really a replication anymore. Yeah. And so, you know, I just want your perspective on those two questions. I think those are great questions and they set us up very nicely for what I'm going to show you next. So let me go ahead and answer your question um, as best as I can. So the first part about why bother unbundling is really important because um, I think, especially as economists looking at it, if, if, it, if it's a market failure from, that comes from information, that is people just don't know what's going on. It could be because uh, and the simplest way of thinking about it is if 100 of us in a village go to a doctor, I experience poor care, and I thought, think it's just because the doctor doesn't like my bald head. And I think that everyone else who has better hair on their head is getting better treatment. And then only then 
from information that comes from household surveys or some other mechanism through to mitigate that failure, do I realize it's actually a social problem, right? So that kind, it's a very simple kind of an information problem, but an information problem that could be solved. And if that happens, then we all band together and solve the problem. The elegance of that approach or that finding is that if, if it's truly just an information problem, then maybe we don't need to do all of these accountability interventions. Maybe we don't need to go get people together in a room, get NGOs to do facilitation and the Jan Sunwai and this and that. Just give people information, figure out how they can use that information or make sense of that information, they'll sort it out. So actually, it, it, is, it is not a... It is an academic exercise in that we think about it a lot more, but in terms, if it really turned out to be that the effect of participation is really zero, or that effect participation does not improve the effect of intervention, either one of these could be true, um, then it could very well be that we should probably stop doing all these types of accountability interventions as we know them, because they really try to bring together these two pieces. But it bring the, the question, the second part you asked is super important because there is no way to unpack the first without thinking about how you can do the second well you know, on a large enough scale. Because clearly doing it in a laboratory is not good enough. You have to take it to the real world. And that's where um, implementing it in the context that's relevant and on a scale that's meaningful becomes important. So in UP, when we discussed this with the government, they said, look, this is a state of over 200 million people. If you cannot do it in a large enough manner, don't bother. We don't want a small experiment. We want something that's done well. You can measure it in a few places because of lack of ability to measure all over the state, but do it in a way that actually demonstrates scale from the implementation point of view. So the way I would think about your question is the following. Replicating does not have to mean the exact same design in the exact same recipe manner. But what it means is we need to understand what the core part of that intervention was, what the purpose was, and try to replicate that in that particular setting that makes sense, which means there will be some heterogeneity across different projects, and that's okay. So when I give information in UP, maybe information about infectious diseases is less important than infectious about, in fact, uh, this information about childhood diarrhea is more important. Maybe if we were doing this in another area where diarrhea was not important, but infectious diseases was, maybe that's what we need to focus on. So the small things are fine, but the broad principles can still be enforced. And what I'm ho hoping to show you on this slide is what we try to do is exactly this, is we were trying to sort out, can we do only information in some areas? And of course, this information had to be developed contextually exactly like you said, I'll show you how we did it. And then we add info facilitation on top of that. This contrasts with the, the Bjorkman uh, Devolve paper, uh, Jacobson Devolve paper, um, and the, in the sense that they did facilitation only versus information plus facilitation. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a different take asking the same question though. And when we, what we did here was, as I told you, the government insisted it needs to, it needs to be large enough by UP standards. And it needs to also then rely on existing local bodies because we don't want to create new institutions just for a project, which will work because it's highly monitored, but it's never going to be sustainable in the long run. Um, so what we developed was, what I'm going to show you today is results from 120 villages where this randomized experiment was done. But it, it basically, rather than creating an experiment only in these villages, what we did was, we took a giant project that the state was doing and then focused on a narrow wedge of it that was happening in some villages and used that to develop the experiment. So an experimental assignment of the state-run program in some of our villages. Um, so that way we get to also claim that the state was running something that was scalable and uh, sustainable and replicable. At the same time, we get to do very careful measurements as well. Um, so just so that we can keep some of the key findings in the back of our head as we, as we start understanding what this study was, um, we find overall that the study had some effects that were large, some that were not so large. The blue lines that you see here are the effects of information and facilitation. And the red lines that you see are the effects of providing information alone. And broadly speaking, I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse as well? Yes, yes. Okay, so broadly speaking, what you see is that nutrition improves a little bit, 
only one of them is statistically significant in, in, in the sense that these are all coming from uh, uh, multiple out outcomes adjusted p-values and, and confidence intervals related to those. So um, the immunization was a big ticket item, and we also see some effects on institutional delivery and health services, right? Broadly speaking, these were the three main sets of outcomes that we had planned to study, and you know, they had some effects. I mean, these are the immunization effects are very large. We'll talk about them. Um, satisfaction, as you will see here, goes in the opposite direction, which is not entirely unsurprising. We go in and tell villagers what they're supposed to receive from people who've not been performing for a while. We, you know, that's normally what's going to happen. The satisfaction would go down. Um, but it also moves in the same direction that areas where you introduce additional facilitation so they can do something about it, rather than just go tell them, the negative effects are smaller in those cases. Um, but as you can see with all the overlapping confidence intervals, we can't really statistically tell you that one is different from the other. Um, what I hope to then also convince you is that it's, it's, it's a matter of sample size uh, because these coefficients are actually fairly large. Uh, sadly, we do not have enough statistical power. So if one of you is going to replicate it, please do it with 10 times as much sample size as we did. Okay. So um, the context and accountability, so let me just jump right in. All of you probably know about UP, so I will not bore you with this slide. The only two things to take away here is that the government was implementing this exact intervention, the facilitation intervention that I'm going to tell you about, in those yellow shaded districts. What we convinced them to do was extend the same information, the facilitation intervention in the two districts that our study sites are. Right? So it's exact same as they were planning to roll it out, because we were helping them with develop the interventions in the 10 districts, we said add two more areas so that we can do it in these magenta shaded districts of Sultan, Sultanpur and Fatehpur. Um, what these guys were doing is, this was part of a World Bank funded uh, government of UP project. They wanted to improve service delivery and health outcomes. And they were focusing on the, uh, the services that are delivered by the three frontline healthcare workers, the three A's, Asha, Anganbadi, ANMs. And they wanted to work through something that the NHM had created almost a decade ago, but was vastly unfunctional, which is the uh, Village Health Sanitation and Nutrition Committee. So the way it works is every time there's a Gram Panchayat election, the secretary, uh, the, the Pradhan and the secretary are supposed to constitute this committee, which includes the members of the local government, the ward members and stuff. They also include some of the frontline healthcare workers, including some of the Asha, Anganwadi, uh, ANMs, and there's some flexibility. They get some discretionary funds every year. They get 10,000 rupees. They are also eligible to request more funds if they need every year. And they have the statutory role that NHM gives them is to identify the needs of the village. If the village needs you know, money to put chlorines over its drains, if, the money need, if they need money for some new stethoscopes or spigomanometers for their ANMs, they can ask for all of this, right? So in some sense, it's exactly what we want. There is a government-run organization that is supposed to do this exact same work of identifying health work, health needs, has some money, has the statutory responsibility and the legal authority to bring in more resources if needed. And then it's the government, it's the, it's the citizen partisanship, participation that is supposed to hold them accountable. So that's what the government was trying to do in these 10 districts. Um, and once a month on the village health nutrition day, they were supposed to provide these services. So it's very clearly targeted towards primary care, immunization, ANC, and nutrition, which is why our main outcomes are targeted at these ones. So what ESA, UPHSSP did, because we wanted to keep the scalable, replicable, and all of that stuff, um, what we did differently in this project is we did not want it to be run through a World Bank project because the kinds of reporting requirements and, and management there are different. Instead, the UPHSSP brought in the State Institute for Rural Development. As many of you know, a number of our states in India have SIRDs, which are the state's apex human capital development firm. Their, their job is to train tens of thousands of people for all kinds of stuff. So they brought in SIRD and gave them a two-year contract to implement this project in 10 plus two districts, as I told you. And so they worked together to develop a suite of information tools, training materials, how they're going to train them, they recruited through their standard recruitment process, which means, as you can imagine, this is government contracting. There's been all kinds of delays, problems, 
questions asked, someone demanded bribes, all everything you can imagine that can go wrong with recruiting 300 people in UP happens, right? So it's far from efficacy. This is about as bad as effectiveness gets, right? So that's the, just pointing this out. So to the extent that we find any effects, this is, this is a very good thing. Um, all right, so these Gram Panchayat coordinators that are recruited and trained by SRD then go into the village, they visit the village and they ask them to show the list of the people who are on the VHSNC. Usually what happens is let's say if Chirantan, Tarun and I are members of the VHSNC and there is a Gram Panchayat Pradhan, the Pradhan knows who are the people on the list but neither none of the three of us know, even know that we are actually members of this committee because no one even knows the committee exists. So the GPC, the Gram Panchayat coordinator, then knocks on Tarun's door and says, hey Tarun, you happen to be a member of the VHSNC, and by the way, these are your roles and responsibilities. The government says you should be meeting every month and asking these following questions. By the way, next month on Tuesday so-and-so date, we are going to be having our first meeting. I will help you convene that meeting, please show up. Now you've activated and facilitated these VHSNCs and then they help coordinate the monthly meeting. They don't run the meeting themselves. They give them feedback. They give them pointers about how it's supposed to be run. The SIRD, because this is its mandate, over the period of this project, trained 10,000 VHSNC members all across these states, the state areas, the 10 districts, and the two districts we were working on what the roles, responsibilities, and functioning of this. So this project started working in May of 2016. As you can see in March, April, the only meetings that were happening were when we were going in to try and do some pilot runs. Um, we were working on this project since 2011, 12. So it took us a few years into project development, contracting and all of that. And once the project actually hit the ground in May, it, you can see the number of meetings went up. So if you look at the, the, this graph, it shows that by March of 2017, a year after the project started, UP was conducting roughly 2,000 meetings a month, which going from close to zero before the pilot run started um, is, is a significant achievement. Right now, whether these things actually led to something is what we want to understand. Um, just to reiterate, this is 2,000 meetings that were happening all across the 10 districts plus the two areas where we are talking about, that roughly covers a population of about 20 million people or so, 20, 21 million. Um, so our objective in all of this is to find what the, uh, the estimated impact of these interventions are when the government implements it. So although we were, as the research team, we were involved in helping the state develop and implement it and ask for monitoring details, we would ask for as much data as we can, um, we did not try to micromanage the process. We wanted this to be a government-run, government-led project. And then we knew that because some failures would happen in the monitoring, we wanted to try and ensure some higher level of fidelity. So initially, we tried to get the government to appoint more managers so that they can ensure if implementation happens perfectly well. And then when we realized that that is going to be even harder to do, what we did was we, we got two types of uh, help. One is for our implement the project uh, experimental detail, which is we wanted information dissemination that was done in a way that we can implement without having to teach the government how to do it all over again. Um, so we brought in a local firm uh, as a contractor and we gave them the responsibility of disseminating information that's come that was collected in the baseline surveys conducted by the government. The second part, uh, which is actually slightly important to note here, is we brought in a third firm that was recruited by the World Bank to just make sure that the meetings are conducted. So their only job was make sure that there's somebody who's tracking, keeping track of meetings that were scheduled. So a week before the meeting, they would call the GPC and say, listen, dude, you're supposed to do this. Are you doing it or not? If you have any problems, let us know we are there to help. But never go and do, the, do it themselves. So it's basically creating one sort of supervisory level of uh, management there. Two, mainly ensure that the implementation was done with a higher fidelity, not to change the nature or the scope of what the program was. Um, and as you can imagine, the reason why we did that is otherwise, if it turns out that we find no effect, one could reasonably ask, well, maybe it was poorly implemented. And if, you, if only you had tried to do better, maybe you would have seen some effect. So that's why we wanted to try one extra step to do that. 
So the study that I'm, the, the results I'm going to show you are going to be fairly straightforward. There are three arms in this study. Manoj. Chirantanir. So um, <clears throat> how do you define a meeting? I know you have a specialized firm to track meetings, but a local village goon can show up and say, hey, what's going on here? What's this meeting about? Ye gore log kya paise de rahe? Vagera, vagera, right? So and Sultanpur and that vicinity is particularly notorious for like local unorganized people. Did you face anything of that to contaminate your treatment? Um, not so much contaminate. We were actually quite surprised with the level of participation. So I jumped ahead a few slides to show you a couple of images of what, what this meeting looks like. So the large image on your right that you see um, is, is typically what a meeting looked like. So some of our meetings, especially for the first few months, had about 70, 80 households that would come for these monthly meetings. And um, here you see a picture of this gentleman. It looks like he's mansplaining these hapless women sitting on the right. But in reality, there were the healthcare workers who are not in the frame were sitting just past the women where the women were sitting. And he was really upset that they had been claiming that immunization had been done, but his grandchildren had not received immunization. Um, and so he was challenging them. And this is sort of what was happening in these meetings is once they got to know that they can challenge healthcare providers, families, villagers, households would come together and they would start raising questions about why did Dalia not show up in our Anganwadi Worker Center? Why is the Anganwadi closed when it should be open? Uh, what happened to the food supply and so on and so forth. The other pictures you see are a mix of the VHSNC meeting happening. So the one on the, on the grid of four, the one on the left right is a much more organized one where they meet in the village uh, office and a calmer meeting versus the VHNDs that happen every afternoon when the same meeting has happened is where the service delivery is done. Now, the point you mentioned about Sultanpur, Fatehpur having potential problems, our problem was not so much the community or the communal issues. In fact, there were relatively few of those. What happened, however, was some of these areas, because we were there was a panchayat election coming up um, towards the end of 2017, some of the politics had already started. So the minute we went in there, some areas felt that maybe this is politically motivated that the Pradhan wanted to bring in a new intervention or not. And some uh, villages had some of it. But broadly speaking, <coughs> there's distance issues in this case. Does that answer your question, Chirantan? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, as I told you, and I, I don't need to belabor this point, this is just to remind each other uh, us of what exactly was there. In the information only arm, we give information on village level indicators of the, for children under five in the village and relative to the district average. We also tell them about the roles and responsibilities of the VHSNC. Most households have never heard about this. And we call them because we had lots of, uh, we collected all this information. We called them through phone calls and interactive voice response messages. We tell them that, look, Tuesday morning, three days from now, there's going to be a meeting. Please do come. You are welcome. You are invited. Your committee wants you to come and so on. In the second arm, we give all of the same, plus the, info, the facilitation intervention that I described to you, where the, the GPC goes in and tries to activate the, um, the VHSNC. OK. The, the analysis, because it comes from such a simple design, experimental design, is also fairly straightforward. There are a few bells and whistles, not so much to uh, sort of make ourselves feel good, but there are serious problems here. Because one is that all our clustered error, standard errors need to be clustered at the village level. That, that's the, the easy part. The harder part is the way that we had devla developed this study is we had developed, the, in, in developed it as a matched trio design. And the reason why we were worried was we actually took Chirantan's concern very seriously. Is one, when we were developing it, if a handful of villages, because our sample size was fairly small and this was expensive to do, if a handful of villages decided they did not want to participate because of political intervention, then we would have been lost a lot of power and we wouldn't know what to do with that. So simultaneously, some other villages found out that, look, there's this facilitation happening elsewhere. We need to do our own thing. Or at the time, actually, there was another risk is that some of the other donors who were working in this space were trying to implement similar programs. So Me Too programs could come up in our intervention, non-intervention areas that could create a problem. So we developed a match trio uh, randomization where essentially we take the data from baseline and use a whole bunch of um, information, 
every possible verifiable, observable information about these villages, and then use a propensity score to create match trio sets. And after, within each match trio set, we then randomize them into treatment area one, two, three, um, treatment arms one, two, three. So, so in terms of the analysis, we just include trio fixed effects, which is basically an extension of what you would do with a matched pair randomization, except this is a trio. So it becomes a little bit more of a tricky thought experiment, but in the, the empirics work fairly similarly. Um, and then everything I show you here is going to be with the family-wise p-values uh, for the rest of the presentation. The last thing is we did have data from baseline, which I just told you about, but it was data from baseline that was collected by a firm that was recruited by the government, and the implementation was not quite perfect. And as a result, there was a lot of messiness around uh, the, the data that was collected had some errors and stuff. So as a result, what we do is I show you the difference in difference analysis as a robustness check. And I just want to flag to you right now that the point estimates are exactly the same with the exception that sometimes the confidence intervals are wider, which is what you would get if you have messy data in one way versus the other. Uh, okay, so I was telling you about the difference in difference that I'll show you as a robustness. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so that's a brief implement implementation timeline. As uh, as we see, this this took uh, about a year between uh, April May of 2017 to 18 that we were uh, running the sorry 16 to 7. Sorry, I need to look at these slides a little more carefully. Um, right, 2016 quarter two to 2017 quarter two was when the actual facilitation happened, and then after that. Uh, one year, we let a whole year lapse before we went back for data collection. And this was a very deliberate choice. And the reason why we did this was because we wanted to make sure that the, um, the data collection that we do includes indicators on children who are under age two. And so we wanted to give children the time to go through at least two years of age so that the children who are born immediately after the intervention is started reach at least two years of age and then we collect data on them. Okay? So by June, July of 2018, the end line was conducted. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, okay, so as I, this slide I already showed you, so we can skip over this one as well. Um, so before we show you the results on what we found, some uh, notes on the costs of these interventions is in order. One is that the cost of providing information alone in a village over this period of time was roughly about $1,750 per gram panchayat. Um, and the reason why we did it per gram panchayat is that the meetings happen per GP level, but the data collection for this is randomly selected to be one village out of these GPs. Uh, and the G village doesn't know which one is going to be sampled for the data collection. Um, same thing for the cost of information plus facilitation was about uh, to, uh, 2750, which basically tells us it costs another thousand dollars roughly per GP to do uh, the kind of facilitation that the government had uh, had uh, budgeted. And just to make sure we were being very careful and con conservative in our calculations, we included not just the cost of what the government was doing, but also the additional cost of the supporting facilitation type of things that we did with the World Bank, um, just to be sure that we cover all costs. Um, okay. So that's where we are. Okay, so as you see here, uh, the balance is almost guaranteed because as I told you, this was a match to your randomization. So there's no surprise here that the samples are matched. It's almost by construction. There's nothing to see here. Um, the only thing to remember is that the baseline numbers are smaller, which we'll come back to later, okay? Okay, so we have data that I'll be showing you from about 4,800 households. We have data on the key health indicators as well as a bunch of other household awareness responsibilities of. Uh, demographics and stuff like that. So our total analytical sample um, is 4,443 households because of some level of non-response, um, but includes data on 5,000, over 5,200 children that we get data on. So let's just jump right in. So these are the three main nutrition outcomes we are interested in. Uh, the stunting, underweight, and wasting. Stunting and underweight are basically indicators that we expect to see uh, more effects on. Wasting for better or for actually for very good reasons uh, is no longer that much of a common problem in India. So in our data, about half the children are either stunted or underweight, right? because stunting is defined as height for weight, age, and we underweight is weight for age, and then wasting is basically looking at your waste weight as a, as in response to your 
uh, height. So uh, the wasting levels are relatively low in India, which is a good good thing. But what that means is also the, your uh, chance, uh, your chances of seeing some effects there are going to be smaller as well. Um, so these effects, as you see here, they're mostly not statistically significant, with the exception of the underweight for information and facilitation. This is significant in the uh, normal p-values without including family-wise p-values. Uh, Once we put in family-wise p-values, these are no longer statistically significant, right? So everything here. Um, but before we just leave this slide and move on, I just want to point out to you that these are roughly three and a half to four, uh, three to four percent um, percentage points relative to about 50% uh, uh, of children who are uh, stunted or underweight. So it's a small effect, uh, but the only good news here is they are all going in the same direction. I, uh, the, the standard errors are, however, too large for us to say that this is uh, statistically significant at conventional levels, especially with the multiple uh, hypothesis test. So then the second thing we said is, well, if, if our results don't find anything on nutrition, which was our first thing that we wanted to look, because the program was supposed to improve delivery of nutrition, can we look at mortality? Because uh, the one big thing that, or in, that's, that shows up in all of the previous literature is mortality. And the good and the bad news is that we don't find any effects on mortality under five. Um, for, from our point of view, that's the bad news. The good news is because um, we were also worried that there could be some bizarre re results happening because of which um, the result, the report, it could be because of simply reporting effects that the mortality might go up and then we might have a big problem on hand, but we don't see that yet. So that's, that's good. Um, but if mortality did not really change, but nutrition has changed a little bit, we needed to ask what could have gone on, what could be going on, even if these are not large significant effects. And so, as I mentioned to you, immunization was a big thing that was happening during these VHMDs. And when we look at immunization, this is where a lot of the action is going on. So full vaccination, I show, I'm showing you five columns here. Full vaccination basically means the child has received full DPT, full polio, measles, and BCG by the time they are two years of age, right? And if you look here, this is the full vaccination. Actually, let me go back here and show you what's going on. So much of this effect here, the 0.8 percentage points that we are talking, 0.8 8 percentage points that we are talking about in column one, which by the time you add in all the controls and fixed effects, it comes to about seven percentage points, relative to about 43% children in the control arm who are receiving full vaccination. So these are not small effects, right? Um, same thing for the full DPT, it's a relative to 73, 74% of children in the, in the control arm receiving full DPT, um, going up by 11 to 12 percentage points. Those are fairly significant effects. Um, but what's useful to note here is it's, it's not going up because of things like BCG. This is consistent with what you would have if a program does not change the input, the one input that happens at birth, because BCG is given only at birth. If you need sustained visits, and sustained visits are what you would see in the DPT because there are multiple doses involved here. Um, you have to have all three doses, so you have a chance of catching up over time. Um, so if you look at the full vaccination result here, the info plus facilitation, which is really where, uh, as Tarun pointed out, you know, you would expect that these are necessary inputs. If you don't think that they are substitutes somehow, and they are both complements that go into production of, of the participation or monitoring, then this is a 30% increase relative to the 43%. The 7% increase here in vaccination from information only, again, it's 7% relative to 43 is fairly large. It's only too bad that our standard errors here are 0 0.44, 0 0.044, so we are not able to find any statistical significance there. Um, and, okay, sorry. I don't know why I had so many of those. So then I also want to draw your attention to uh, an additional set of analyses that we did. Um, I'm showing this to you only as an example and also to seek feedback. So in one round of our referee reports that we received, um, one of the reviewers really pushed hard saying, look, this is not the right way to analyze this entire experiment. And the way, the, the point that the reviewer uh, made, and, I, and we struggled very hard with this actually, we are not convinced this is the right way to do it, is the reviewer's point was both of these arms include information. So the way to do it is to say, what's the pooled effect of information alone, which 
probably might or might not be exactly what we see here on these point estimates. And then the marginal effect of providing information for facilitation in that sense. So you have the pooled analysis of just information, everybody who got information, and then the marginal effect of getting facilitation. Statistically, I mean, obviously from, from, a, from a math point of view, you get exactly the same result. But I think given how the project was developed and implemented, we like our, more method, our presentation of how we've shown it to you so far versus the, this is what the, the alternate way of showing the pooled analysis would be. As you can well, see. Uh, if I may interrupt you. So in, in the original way in which you uh, showed the result, uh, I think one question would be that what does the coefficient represent the difference from, right? And I think the, say for example, the information only in column five, 0 0.088 represents the difference between information only and no intervention. Exactly. And information plus facilitation shows the impact of the combination compared to no intervention. Exactly. And so we'd be curious to know what's the impact of facilitation plus information minus the information only treatment. Yeah. So is and the I, 0 0.134 statistically different from 0 0.088? Right. And I think that's exactly what the uh, referee's point as well was, which is, I, I apologize that I copy pasted this in a rush. Um, the, the label here should say the marginal effect of information of facilitation. Yeah. Sorry. So this is exactly what you were asking is in some sense, um, the 0.87 is the effect of information relative to control, getting nothing at all. And the 0.46, which is this second uh, coefficient down here, is the effect of getting facilitation over and above the intervention. So now it's being compared to the first column, the first row here, right? But it makes sense. The, the 0 0.134 is just a sum of 0 0.87 plus 0 0.46. It's mathematically exactly the same. It's a matter of representation. Um, the reason I keep, and I, I would love to get feedback and, and thoughts about this is, I'm not comfortable describing it as 0.56 as the marginal effect of facilitation, because that's not what we did. Right? We were not. We developed this whole thing because of. I think, uh, Tarun, if I can stretch your point a little further, we really believe that these things work together, because there might. It's not just the marginal effect. There's something about describing these two effects together. It's not the marginal effect of one one intervention versus the other. And this was a three arm intervention. You should be agnostically able to say arm one versus arm two versus splitting out the components of arm one and arm two, which assumes strict additiveness of the, um, of these interventions. Um, we, we can talk more about this. And I, I, I know there is no straightforward answer, but um, let, let's just go through. I'll show you all the results I show you are from the main specification because that's one we are still in love with. Um, but I'm, I, have, I have to take the comments very seriously. So that's where I'd love to get your feedback. Okay. Um, so then the second uh, set of outcomes is around child diarrhea. The reason why we are looking at diarrhea is, as most of you uh, would know, children, about 15 to 20% of children in rural India on any given day are suffering from diarrhea. And so if interventions like these change the behavior of households, where they take the paid children to get treated earlier, they are now aware of what's available, that could have a huge effect, not just on diarrhea, but on nutritional outcomes as well. Um, sadly, we don't find any effects there at all. There's nothing going on. These point est estimates are trivially small. Um, so we don't, we, we don't belabor this. Then we changed our so switch attention to say, all right, if it's not about the child, there were mothers who were pregnant at the time when this intervention was introduced. Um, remember, these are the same three healthcare workers who are supposed to get mothers into healthcare centers for delivering babies, partly because of government uh, funded programs that are starting to support them, but also because that's, that's sort of the job that they're supposed to do. Give ANCs, uh, increase the number of ANC visits. There's, so there's both intensive and extensive margin efforts on ANC that they're supposed to do, as well as increase the amount of institutional deliveries. And what we find here is that although there is no effect per se on the if, number of ANC visits, um, so, you know, going from 2.2 visits on average uh, in these, in the control arm, the number of visits don't really change very much at all. But what we do see that changes significantly is the institutional delivery rates. So, and this is quite surprising because it starts from 80%, which, you know, most of India right now is the institutional delivery rates are north of 80. So that's, 
that's in some sense good, but they were able to accomplish roughly about a 10% improvement, about less than 10, uh, 6.8 percentage points in info plus facilitation and 6.5 in the info only. So fairly comparable implement, in, increases in both types of treatments uh, in the institutional delivery arms along. Um, right. So uh, with, was there a comment, Tarun? No, go ahead. Um, so with that, we then shift our goals and look at the satisfaction, which was one of the last pre-specified outcomes that we had promised to look at. Reason why we were interested in satisfaction is the hypothesis was that maybe if we gave information alone, it would obviously have an effect of uh, reducing satisfaction because now people would know something basic like, wait a minute, the A&M worker is supposed to have treatments for your primary care. That's, that is something she's supposed to have and be able to provide, and that they're supposed to show up X number of times and they don't. Um, the information plus facilitation, the theory of change that was hypothesized when we developed the project was that we give this information, then, the, then as you saw that gentleman in that slide was supposed to challenge healthcare workers, their service delivery was supposed to improve, and then the satisfaction was supposed to come trail behind. So we had originally hoped that the difference between the information and info plus facilitation was going to be large with info being alone being negative and hopefully info plus facilitation moving into the positive space. Um, we don't see that kind of a movement, although there is at least some movement in the right direction. It's not statistically significant. So if I had shown you this exact same slide uh, in that alternate specification of the pooled analysis, then you would see that and say, look, there's not much going else there as well. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically the story here is that the satisfaction, if anything, we managed to make the villagers uh, even less satisfied than they were to start with. Um, okay, then what we find here is uh, when we were looking at our data, and this is an incidental finding, so I want to be very clear about this, is that this is not something that we had hypothesized or even sort of anticipated. We found that the number of births in our treatment arms regardless of which type of treatment arm, was significantly lower in the last year compared to the other ones, the control arm. And it was not a small number. This was a fairly large effect. And so we said, we, should, you know, this, we cannot just ignore this. We need to understand what's going on. So um, essentially, when you're looking at any birth in the past one year, uh, what we find is that relative to 35% of households in the control villages that had at least one birth in the past year, the percentage of households that had birth went down by at least five percentage points in the info plus facilitation and almost five percentage points in the others, um, which is a very large reduction in births. If this is, I won't use the word, uh, word birth rates uh, or fertility because they have very specific meanings in both in demography uh, as in particular. So I won't, I'll, I'll refrain from using those terms, but in terms of the number of the households that had births in the past one year, it's actually significant lower. Um, so one hypothesis then was, well, maybe children are dying. Maybe what's happening is that in the treatment areas, bizarrely children are dying, conditional on being born. We don't see any effects of uh, evidence of that either. And so then we said, well, maybe, you know, can we, can we at least run some back of the envelope calculations to say, you know, if this was being drawn, uh, being uh, driven by some bizarre data collection problems, so my first fear when this happened was that maybe our, our guys did something wrong in the field and uh, maybe they collected, I think we are almost out of time, I'm going to jump through. So we tried to do falsifications and nothing was there and then I'll just show you the falsification and stop. Um, sorry about that, I, I lost time. No worries, no worries, yeah. Okay, I promised you difference in difference. This is the easiest way to look at it. The point estimates on your left are exactly what I showed you from the, um, uh, what do you call it? from the reduction in stunting, underweight, and nutrition. The red ones are what you saw in the, in the tables earlier, and the blue ones are the results from the difference in different specification, right? So that includes the baseline. And as I told you, because our sample size at baseline is half as much and is noisier, we expect it to have a larger confidence interval. So at least the, it's, a, it's an unbiased estimate. It's just more noisy in this case. Same thing for childhood immunization. If anything, our DD estimates look a little nicer on the uh, immunization. Treatment diarrhea, institutional delivery, the same thing as well. Um, I'll show you one other finding which I think is worth noting and I'll stop. 
uh, we looked at heterogeneity by gender and caste. Um, now, again, this was not something that was part of the original analysis plan, but with gender, um, uh, for simplicity's sake, we've called the girls red and boys blue here. What you see here is that the reductions in stunting much higher among boys, not statistically significant, but there's a consistent, sad, consistent pattern. The reduction in underweight, again, more among boys. Reduction in wasting, more among boys. Um, same thing you see for immunization, the only thing that's not so much here. The only one result that's statistically significant in all of this, and we do uh, use the family-wise adjusted p-values only test for this, is this one. Institutional delivery rates by gender. And what the interpretation, especially in the info plus facilitation villages is, is where we provided the facilitation. Clearly there has to be sex selective abortion going on here. Or sex, there's sex determination happening for sure. What this is telling you here is even if they are not aborting the fetus, girls are bo being born at home almost the same as the, con the control areas are, but the boy boys are going to be born in hospitals. So clearly this cannot be because of chance. This is a household decision that's happening very sort of consistent and uh, consistent with these patterns of uh, gender specific investments that households are making. Um, so we were quite disappointed to see this graph. Over so, you could, uh, could I uh, offer an alternate explanation? So when you're going to go for an institutional delivery, yeah. you might have had an ultrasound in advance. And so despite the restrictions of the PNDT Act, they find out the gender of the child, and then they find out it's a going to be a boy. So now you'd better go for the institutional yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly that. That might be so it's exactly. Not gen, it's not sex selective abortion, right? But conditional on knowing that it's going to be a boy, you're much more careful with the delivery, and therefore yeah. go to the institution for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should be careful about that. I, I, I'm trying to rush, but I think your interpretation is much closer to what what we should be repeating as well. Um, yeah, is that that during the ANC process, if the hospital you might have discovered it's a boy, which itself is a violation. But conditional on that, it reflects household household preferences and investments. Um, the, the patterns on caste are not that salient either. Um, we see a little bit of a difference where the non-SCST seem to improve more than the SCST. So the reductions are more stark among the non-SCST households. Um, but it's not a largely consistent or, or sort of consistent pattern that one, one can even say that there is a pattern here. It's a little bit all over the place. So that's it. Um, let me stop here with the main findings so on the slide and I'll, I'll stop here. And the main thing I want to take away from here is we do find large effects that are fairly comparable for both. Whether this means that information alone has just as much effect as information plus, plus facilitation, I'm reluctant to say so because the point estimates are roughly about 50% larger. It's just that they are not statistically significant. So it might well be that we were underpowered to test this given our settings. Um, it's, it's also possible that information is the only thing that matters. We can't rule it out with, with this study. So our evidence largely, if you think about all, all taken together, the evidence that we find of the effect of interventions of account for accountability is roughly in the middle in declining order of these uh, the studies that have come out so far in the last year. Um, but it also says something about the political economy being important. The fact that we are able to see anything in UP when the government was implementing it is, I think is a, is a big deal. Um, but sadly it, it has not been scaled up. So I'll just leave it at that. So thanks so much, Manoj. Uh, so is there anyone from the audience who would like to ask a question? This is, so just feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. No questions? Okay, so I just have a suggestion on, uh, you know, the, I think interpretation of the results and one suggestion is that your main finding is that if you look, compare information to nothing, you find a big effect. If you, find, if you compare information and facilitation to nothing, you find an even bigger effect. But the statistical difference between information and facilitation or the plus facilitation is, you know, it, that's, it's not statistically different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at least from a policy perspective, a simple way to do it is like, you know, set up a triangle. And so here's the here's a pairwise difference between the three edges, and then you choose what policy. So the policymaker can decide what they want to do. 
Yeah. I, I think so I think from a scientific perspective, we can interpret these results quite cleanly. But from a policy perspective, to make policy recommendations on whether they should do information achievement, uh, treatments only or information plus uh, uh, facilitation uh, things only, is a choice. And let that choice, you know, let us not make those determinations of those choices. But the yeah. but the value of you know each of those should be clear. The comparisons between each of them. So I really like the triangle, and I think we we might actually end up using that to show the differences and so be able to at least take two or three key outcomes and say, look, this is how these point effects play out, and we can show them. I, I really like that that way of doing it. But I think also, Tarun, if, if we were to take that very seriously, I think that is also um, another point of support to show results as we have done right now, which is to show ARM1 versus ARM2, because that is what policymakers care about. That's, I, I mean, mean yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm never sure what they care about. <laughs> so so I, I, would, I would say that uh, you know, sometimes there are trade-offs in terms of costs and so on and so forth. Right. And you did mention the dollar cost of each of those. Yeah. And so, you know, at least from this paper's perspective, you can set these results out and then the okay. policymakers can choose. Got it. Uh, but we also have a question from Abhishek Dureja. So Abhishek, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask a question? Oh, thank you. So uh, like you, uh, you showed the result that there is a enhanced, uh, there is enhanced institutional delivery in the treated districts. So can so my question is can enhanced delivery lead to lower mortality and hence lower births amongst the treated districts, which you actually observe, uh, which you actually show in your results? Greater institutional delivery, which leads to better care, which leads to fewer deaths. Fewer, child, yes, it could be, but we don't see any effects on deaths. Right? What we see is fewer births. Yeah, so that can be a that can be a mechanism for fewer births. So you're saying fewer deaths, therefore fewer. But that yeah. there's not enough. It's entirely possible, um, but we don't have enough time, right? So it would have to be a family that uh, we'll have to believe that children, people who are trying for babies, are trying to have babies every nine month cycle. It'll have to be that frequent in order for it to show. I and mean, these the the effects we are seeing here are fairly large. Right. So the only way it would work is all these households tried in the first year when the program was going on. Some of them were successful. They did not, the child did not die. And then therefore they did not have enough uh, second birth next time. So that's why it, it, I can show you back here. We went back and looked at the conditional on births, whether the child, children dying or not. There's no evidence to show that there's much difference in deaths, but also the time gap is not enough for that effect to play out. I'm sure it happened at least once, but um, it's probably not enough to account for a 15%, 13% difference that we are seeing here. Okay, so, but can't that also happen through better immunization as well? Fewer births? Yep. So, it can have, so actually, you know what, since you're asking this, let me just show you. In order for that mechanism to happen, the number of deaths that need to happen to compensate for that would have to be a very large number, right? So if you think, so one way we thought about it is that there's some deaths that we don't observe. And those deaths, either because someone is under-reporting it, like because we asked the household, did somebody die? And they've clearly not told us, or maybe it didn't happen. Let's say it is that, that somebody did, that children died and they did not report, or it's that, you know, immunization improves so children who should have died did not die. It's, it doesn't matter which way we look at it. The point is the number of children have to be large enough. If you think about it as missing data problem, and which is the way we looked at it, but we can also try to think of it as an imputed way of immunization saving births, therefore some deaths that would have happened didn't happen. It would have to be very large in order to make up for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, we can run through the numbers in, in, in detail, but the point is that the immunization saves lives, but it's not of this order of magnitude because it's not going from zero to nothing, right? All we are saying is that children who got immunized now finish their second full round of immunization. It's not, it's not the first, it's not an extensive margin response that we're thinking about here. All right. 
So great. Uh, so if there are no other questions, so I'd just like to thank uh, Manoj for a you know fascinating talk. I think this is the edge on which so much uh, health policy is being decided and debated. And so you know this is absolutely fascinating work. And uh, hopefully you know Manoj, this would be the point at which uh, of this talk where uh, we go out at least for a Gujarati meal or coffee and tea and all that stuff. But uh, your trip to Ahmedabad is long standing. I know. <laughs> and hopefully, uh, you know, if not 2020, but by 2021, we'll get you here. I am. Uh, believe it or not, we can try to come here in the middle of all of this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to the government to see if we can do something with them. But um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. It was great talking to all of you. Have a great evening and stay safe. Thank you so much, Manoj. Bye-bye.